So as to lend a little bit of insight as to the credibility of why I am showcasing even anything that I'm doing in the market, right? I'm trying to give the viewer an insight as to a, a modern approach to a, a, like more fundamental analysis, right? Like buy and hold. Uh, if you believe in something, then you ought to hold it for quite a long bit of time. That type of mentality seems to have been faded more recently with, you know, the the type of investor that's going on today. Like, you know, you're trying to it, the, a lot of the swing traders, the straddlers, the option traders. That that's kind of like our age group of of investors. Right. But some, well, because also because keep in mind we're young, relatively young. In, in the investing world and like investing is boring, right? Like when you buy and you just put it aside and you don't think about it for like 20 years and then pull it out. Like, you know, that's what, that's why we have mutual funds and 401ks that, you know, we are already doing that. Like that's boring shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> like if you're going to be actively involved in it, you know, you might as well like, you know, in your spare time or as a hobby, try to figure out where you, when and where you pull your money out, you know, like, I mean, and if, and if you're not good at it, fine, you know, then just throw that money at your 401k or whatever. But, you know, if you think that you can develop strategies and, and extract an edge from the market, you know, why not? Why not give it a shot? You know what I mean? And so that's, that's why doing all this analysis is fun, you know? Okay. Well, I mean, I, I see, I see your point and I, I'm always going to play devil's advocate. And the reason why is because that to me is, I do, you know, me, I'm like the most non-conservative person in the world. But when it comes to the, the, the market, I tend to be a little bit more conservative than the Risk average off. young, that, you know, the average younger uh, trader, because it's just, well, one, I, I don't even see myself as I've gotten out of a few trades, like you said, like taking my my wins when I can take them. However, I'm not usually I'm not looking to, to get into a position and get out like the next day, like how some option traders are or whatever. You know, what I mean, so that's why I like Ethereum is because I I honestly believe that it is kind of like a longer hold position, I guess. I don't know. I mean. Yeah, that's the this idea. I, I don't know if you've heard of it of the flippening, right? There's this word that gets thrown around in the crypto world called the flippening, and the flippening just means that it's this idea that eventually Ethereum's market cap is going to supersede or or pass Bitcoin's, and that Ethereum is going to become the the number one crypto. And you know, uh, like if you look at the fundamentals and the way that technology works, it would make sense that that would happen because uh, Ethereum is just so much more uh, like versatile in its like, uh, in its use cases. Um, you can, you know, uh, store data on there, like the data gets, you know, uh, written into the blockchain forever. Um, you can use it as a payment network. You can program it as a smart contract. So in other words, it's a contract, like, the, like uh, you can program a, a transaction to act as a contract, but also it's kind of like a self-fulfilling contract. So you can say, all right, well, um, you know, uh, both parties, you know, you can have like a, like a three person, thing where it's like, okay, but these uh, party A and party B need to agree that the job has been completed. And once they submit their signatures onto the contract, then party C who is already paid, you know, in Ethereum, uh, will th like, th like that, that Ethereum will be transferred, you know, in whatever percentages and ratios to party A and B, like you can, it's a, it's a programmable contract so there's a lot of different and there's a lot of different use cases like that it's very uh modular ethereum and bitcoin doesn't really do that um and so you know it seems like it would it, it would make more sense that ethereum would be like the leading crypto 
but it's just not right now because uh like the primary use case for cryptos is is, is uh, like speculation and storage of wealth and right now like bitcoin just has that momentum uh but that could change and that's that's this idea of the of the flipping okay uh, as to understand more on crypto there's only a certain amount of crypto out in the blockchain correct uh yes um yes and no <laughs> so uh the with bitcoin for example we have to address them individually because just to say crypto is kind of like a blanket statement so we have to address each blockchain individually so for example with the bitcoin blockchain uh that code is written so that there will never be any more than 21 million bitcoin there will never never be 21 more than 21 million bitcoin and i think like several million bitcoins have already been lost so really it's only something like 16 or 17 million bitcoin will ever be possibly be in circulation as of today however uh not all of that not all of that uh uh bitcoin has been mined uh there's only a certain number of million number of bitcoin in circulation right now and every four years it's been a while since i've it's not like riding a bike it's been a while since i've i've, I've read the stats but i think it's every four years uh there's this phenomenon with bitcoin called uh the having right ha as in half and okay. uh and so so the, the 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 amount of bitcoin that can be mined uh in a given four year period halves every four years that can so be mined is that, that can what you're be saying? mined that can be mined yeah what is what is what is that itself mining so mining is like uh basically these these crypto rigs they're like uh Think of them as like super duper advanced graphics processors. They're processors, right? That process uh, the mathematical code of Bitcoin. Um, and, and Bitcoin started out with like zero block, right? The zero block was basically like a hash, which is like, a, like, like a, okay. Back in the days of Wikipedia, let's rewind for a second. Uh, back in the days of not Wikipedia, but uh, WikiLeaks, right? Uh, what was his name? Julian Assange, right? He communicated with uh, like different people like, uh, like Edward Snowden. And like they were communicating over a secure network using something called PHP, right? Or, uh, or PGP, which stands for pretty good security. And... PGP has long been known to be very secure. Hackers use it. Um, it was like the best uh, form of like person-to-person -person communication and data transfer that hackers had available to them, right? It encrypted the information. There were two keys, which consisted of a strain of, of, of random letters and numbers. And the, the, the sender could receive it and the receiver could receive it, but when the receiver received the information, it was encrypted. And the only way that the two parties could read each other's messages back and forth was if both of them had that key. There was a public key, which just basically encrypted the information. Um, and there was a private key, and you couldn't read the encrypted information on the other end without the private key. And the private key was generated in a random like uh, process from the public key, so it, it it gets a little hairy. But basically, blockchain uh, encryption is based off of that technology, sort of, right? And and I'm not like a tech guy, so I may be leaving out parts, but that's basically how it works. What happens with blockchain, and the reason that it gets more and more secure over time, is that you're using the encrypted data of the previous block to encrypt the next block. So every time you move on to another block in this chain of data blocks, the, the encryption is getting stronger and stronger, right? And it's impossible to go back and like hack old transactions or respend money because 
that information has not only has it been based off of the previous encryption and the previous transactions, but it's being it's being um, it's being broadcast to all the other nodes on the network, and they all confirm each other's work. So even if somebody came in with their own node and try and and and, and decoded the 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 encryption, they would have to convince all the other nodes on the network that their version was right, and that's just impossible the way the math works. So, getting back to the original question, um, real quick, I'm sorry. Yeah, do you, you think could, right you, now? Do you think right now I should go in? Since it's at two twenty nine, which I because I, I have a five dollars at two forty. Would it be wise to dollar cost average a small amount right now? Um, it's okay. It, I don't give a fuck. Yeah. <laughs> I like if I was going to put on a position trade now would be a good entry. I think I might wait. Uh, if I was going to be sitting down here looking at the monitor for the next four hours, uh, I would wait and I would wait for like a turnaround or, or to see it stall. I don't have any signals that it's stopping, but I, I, I do see it slowing down. Um, there's a danger that if it drops below this trend channel right here, oh, look at it. Look, it's dropping right now. Uh, but see, like when you look at the chart, that's like another thing. Like I would sit here and watch it, but I would also, also be checking my emotion. Because if it hits this line, I'm like, oh, this is going to be a perfect buy-in. Like sometimes it's just a good idea to wait for that next candle. You know, it's, it's not going to break out of this channel with this... Like, I I don't look at the price at all. Like the price doesn't freak me out. Like it's okay. re it's really like the, these lines and stuff like that. Yes, it could be a good entry. It might drop, you know, a couple more dollars, four or five more dollars, uh, before it bounces. But I would want to look. I would want to be watching that level when it hits that this this up the this support right here, this diagonal support, uh, because. If it drops below that and a candle closes beneath it, it could point to like more downside uh, movement. So it's just, um, yeah, it's a it, it's a good time to enter. But personally, like as like a swing trader, I like, I would want to keep an eye on it. I like how you mentioned. I would like to keep my emotions in check, right? To check my emotions. I right. think that is probably the best thing I've ever heard in 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 this in the market at all. Just you know, just complimentary to whether or not you are right because you have to have a little bit of courage to play this racket. But also, to uh, another bit of advice is to be like, well, you know, don't don't be so careless. You know, to check your emotions. How you said it. I mean that that bodes well for an investor. It's. Like a, it's a good rule of thumb to uh, de like develop your plan and decide how you're gonna execute the trade first. This like uh, it, it, that was kind of like an on the spot thing because I because you did tap on my emotions right there. It's like uh, it's like yeah, it's a good entry point. You know, you could get the bottom if you buy right now, but then you might not. So the only way to like uh, really hedge your risk is to come up with a plan ahead of time. Say, I'm going to execute this plan. I'm going to document everything about it. I'm going to document not only when I came in and when I came out, but what I was thinking, where I thought it was going, even what the weather was like outside. Because some traders will find that they trade terrible when, it, when it's hot outside or when it's raining. And there's no rhyme or reason. Maybe it's just affecting some part of them psychologically and they're depressed because it's cloudy and rainy outside so after they take on so many trades and they build up that data over time you know you say okay i am not going to make any trading decisions today because it's muggy outside and that somehow screws with my decision making it doesn't seem like it would it doesn't sound like it makes any sense but 
but but good traders will do that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's a good entry point. Would I take it right now? No, because I personally have not developed a plan. I haven't done my due diligence. I haven't, you know, done any of that stuff. Right on. And I literally just uh, purchased five dollars at two twenty-eight. I uh, just did that right now, and uh, you know, I feel okay about it because, like you said about my due diligence and all that. As you're saying that, that literally, it just not that I'm looking for signals, but that's exactly what I am trying to do here, right? I'm trying to dollar cost average my position, and since I entered at two forty, well, I mean. Okay, so I'll take the difference, right? Two twenty-eight, two forty. Okay, two uh, somewhere in the in the in the thirties. You know, okay, that's that's okay for me. That's where I see myself. Even though I am way off of where I originally wanted to be, right? I I should have gone in at the two hundred mark, but because of 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 different factors, right? Of me saying, well, let me be more patient, and then sometimes that can come back and bite you if you're too patient and you just say, okay, well. I missed that train or whatever. I'll come back the next day or when it, but look, we're seeing it now as it, as it's doing what it's doing. It just reaffirms all of the things that I've been, you know, in my notes, going through my notes, I'm saying, okay, well, what's the theory I'm doing and checking it. And a lot of investors, like, I don't look at this. I don't look at the price every day, or I don't look at the market every day. I do since I am in this for a certain time. So if I have an alert where it's coming down at a certain price. And I do want to get some at that price just to, just to dollar cost average. That's kind of where my head's at really. Um, <clears throat> with respect to where the price is going, when I told you that I was looking at the four hour chart, right? On Ethereum, on Coinbase. And I say that because like the price is going down. There's a diagonal level of support that we're getting near. And we're also getting near this FIB level. Remember, we talked about FIBs and how the whole universe is built on this number 1.618. And there's like frequently, very frequently, when you measure a move, pro a major move properly with a, with a FIB retracement tool, you get these turnarounds at these key FIB levels, right? So, so we're getting a diagonal level of support, an upward diagonal level of support and a fib at the same time. And so these are strong um, support levels. So I can see us grad like bottoming out around here. It might drop outside of the channel even because the fib is just slightly outside of this upward tra channel. But I could see us kind of like consolidating for a few hours and maybe coming up tonight. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is uh, if you look, you know, every time you get these triangular um, patterns, you get breakouts at the end of it. You know, these are these are important like areas to pay attention to. And so, yes, you know, you you bought right here at two twenty nine. We could possibly come up to uh, two fifty, but then again, like at that point, I'm gonna be on high alert. You know, if it rides the bottom of this of this support. I'm going to be on high alert anyway, but um, really for like a long-term position, you want to look at like a daily chart or a monthly chart. So when we pull out, we look at this, this, uh, this, this daily chart, this upward trend uh, is going to reach a key level of resistance at 253 and 68 cents um, because that kind of is where the where the 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 top of the fib is from this recent drop that we had with COVID. Um, so there are significant levels of resistance above us. Uh, that is uh, what what you just did buying those that that Ethereum. I think is like maybe a good um, four or five day move. Uh, but the fact that were um, at the top of this recovery long term as a as right. a long term investor, I would actually be considering shorting um, because we only have like I would classify what you just did as like a swing trade, you know, 
or or maybe even like a day trade over like two three days um because over over the next couple of days and you know it could be any day but i think over the next couple of days we will be making our way down um we could go i'm thinking we could go as high as like 280 280 to 300 um but but at that point and not really that because we have some i don't know like i mean part of technical analysis is just like uh it's measuring things out it's applying you know the indicators to a lesser degree but mainly like looking at price action looking at fibs looking at volume and uh and uh and, and you don't and, have a part of it is getting a vibe you don't have a problem with what i did there right because again you know uh on I'm the looking, short term no on the short term no if we're talking a couple of days um and i'm sitting down watching it or at least setting an alert then then yeah i i'd feel comfortable doing that uh on the long term no um uh, because i think that we're overbought to a certain extent um, we saw this pullback, uh, but yeah, like, I mean, Friday and going on into the weekend, um, there, I'm going to be paying attention. Uh, I'll set, I'll set some alerts. Uh, I don't know what, what app you're using for alerts. I like to use Dractu. It's uh, D R A K D O O. Uh, you have to pay for the alerts, but it's really good. It's uh, there's a lot of apps that like you'll set, set a crypto alert and sometimes it'll alert you, sometimes it won't. Um, but drag to you, you pay for those alerts and they they almost always ring. Okay. I honestly, for alerts, I just kind of go with this percentage. And usually I don't think I even have an alert with my, with my, any of my, uh, my position with Ethereum, but it's like 5% or 10% moves. And I get an alert from my brokerage. Like they'll just, I, I have it in my settings. You know, it's like, it's, it's, this is a very basic type of alert notification like hey um you know this stock is moving five percent this way that that type of alert it's so it's not very uh sophisticated to say the, to say the least look at this this is interesting are you watching the screen i am so we're looking at one minute candles and this is intraday so this is over over today and that's actually pretty clean for one minute candles usually you don't get like uh clean candles on the one minute um but we can see some clear support right here marked out by these dips and you don't have to be inclusive like it doesn't it's not like connect the dots where you know your third grade teacher is gonna get pissed at you because you missed a couple like it's it's okay when you're doing technical analysis to leave stuff out you're just maybe you're basically getting like a zone a support and resistance zone it's sometimes it's not good to think of it as a support and resistance line it's better to think of it as a zone like in star trek where you had the neutral zone like like so you draw these as zones sometimes and um and we can see like kind of like a clear clear channel being set out so you know you bought down here i could see it coming back up like uh over the next uh few hours or half a day it look it's pointing to maybe tonight uh you you could get like six percent out of it or i'm sorry that's uh more like three or four percent but i mean it, i think this is good for a move uh but okay. but i'd be paying attention to it. uh overall trend channel though over like uh the next couple of days points downward so. And see, like, if I, I got it at 228, and I'm just keeping an eye, it's just, a, a, I'm a, you know, a creature of, of habit. Like, I'm just looking at the price. And, yeah. and it, again, it's, uh, it hasn't really moved too far once it got there. Well, look, look, I mean, you, you bought down here at the bottom of the trend channel and it jumped. Um, so, you know, we're like already minutes later getting ready to top out i would be paying attention like that's another thing like if you really want to get a good idea of where it's going and what it's doing just because you're doing like long-term 
Fasting doesn't mean that I like it can't hurt to look at the minute, uh, the minute chart, okay. or or or, okay. or or vice versa. You know, if you're taking a day trade, um, it's not gonna hurt to go in and look at a like like thirty minute candles because if it seems to be going up, uh, but something is going on like with five minute candles and it's already like pushing against support in a in a negative way that's not going to be reflected on the daily candles it might look like a wick or it might look like oh it's maybe it'll bounce you know what i mean but okay. you know the, okay. the 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 future may all be already be written in the stars like on a on a smaller time frame so it's helpful to go down there and look at those things yeah man you got a pretty healthy bounce right here and just kind of looking at my long, the I guess the big picture with what I want to do with this, since I, I'm super young when it comes to cryptocurrency, and I am not quite sure as to what I, I my expectations should be, because in my notes and, and my strategy is to buy low and sell high, right? It's kind of, it's more of a fundamental uh, mentality a strategy to it. Um, I guess my question to you is, isn't, isn't that what my, my strategy should be with at least my goals or should I be looking to use leverage to get it at, at below 300 and then, you know, whatever with it and hopefully it gets, uh, you know, maybe I make a uh, double three X, four X my money and then get out of it. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, what, what do you think as far as like, my, my treating my strategy for it um there are because i listen i listen to chat with traders that's like the best that's like the number one podcast in the world for traders right and he interviews the world's best traders right and i've listened to a lot of those episodes and after you listen to like a hundred of those things you pick up on these recurring themes that all of these like tier one traders, institutional traders, you know, he even interviews like brand new traders that have made the, a name for themselves over the last year. You know, there's a recurring theme with these guys and that's uh, risk management is the number one, right? You're, you always got to mitigate risk. Uh, Gordon Gecko in wall street uh, says it, he says, uh, when he's talking to that British dude, he says, uh, he says, if you burn your capital reserves, you won't have a pot to piss in. And in, in different ways, these guys say the same thing. If you blow up your account, you are not, you're not going to be able to come to the table. You know, you can't play, you can't play blackjack in, in Vegas. If you don't have money, you know, you have to bring money to the table. And so, um, the number one rule is always to protect your capital. And, uh, and uh, one of the rules that they always throw around that I hear cited a lot is, is one, risk capital is the amount of money that you can put in your trading account and it won't hurt you if you lose it. But it doesn't stop there. Like, if you're a, a, a day trader or a swing trader or a position trader, uh, based off of your time frame, you shouldn't really be, maybe it's 1% for a day trader or 2% for a swing trader or 3% for a position trader, but you should never really risk more than that from your risk capital. So, you know, let's just say for simplicity's sake that you have a hundred dollars, it would be more than that. But let's say you have a hundred dollars of risk capital, you know, doesn't matter if you lose this hundred dollars right now. Uh, you're, you're not, you're not going to go hungry. Uh, you know, Amanda's not going to go hungry. You're uh, nobody, not, you're not going to lose your house. Nothing bad's going to happen, right? You can lose this whole hundred dollars. Nothing bad's going to happen. You're just going to maybe be pissed off about it. So that doesn't mean go trade. Uh, so, so that's the money that's in your brokerage account, but that doesn't mean to throw a hundred dollars at this one trade because then you won't be able to even take an experimental trade or learn or anything like that. It should only be one to 3% of your risk capital, which means 
that you're only risking a dollar on this trade or two dollars on this trade or three dollars on this trade. Now, obviously, you scale that up to you know a thousand, ten thousand, hundred thousand based off of where you're at, but you never you never trade more than than three percent of your risk capital on any given trade, um, and that will ensure that you're able to uh, one save and build up your brokerage account over time but you're never going to be down you know if you lose if you have three or four losing trades in a row you know and you lose you know 10 percent of your account it's still really nothing off your off of your brokerage account i mean it's not a lot and you can take that opportunity you can say wait i lost four times in a row I'm doing something wrong. Let me go back to the books. Let me go back and see and to, to my to my trading journal. Let me see what's happening over and over again. Maybe I can uh, stop doing something. Maybe some there's some kind of correlation somewhere. And then you just build it up. Where it's all about like writing down everything and then trying to correlate what's good and what's bad, and then fishing those out. It's all psychology. It's all psychology. It's one of the reasons why. I pulled out in a big way. I was like, okay, I need to write books. I need to go to a therapist. I need to go to a marriage counselor. I need to do research on psychology to figure out what's going on with me as a person. Um, so, and, and, uh, I've heard traders say that like, uh, if you're a Buddhist monk, like you'll, you'll make a fortune in the market. Cause it's all about detachment too. Like, uh, you know, if you're able to, it's, it's the, again, it's that emotion thing. If you're able to detach your mind from money and it's just charts on a screen, like I told you the other day, like I'm a badass analyst, you know, but I, you know, I, I'm trigger shy when it comes to, to placing orders, I get scared. And so, you know, it's, uh, that's normal though. That, that, that to me, at least it's not, okay. Like for instance, yeah, it's right normal, now, but for example, <laughs> Just for example, right? Like right now, I pulled but, the trigger but, at two twenty-eight. But top, but top gun traders are not normal. You know, there's there's only a handful of them. <laughs> there, you, you know, but there's a reason, and there's a methodology as to how they got there. I don't believe, at least in this racket, I don't think that overnight. You know, I think you pay for your education. You know, regardless if you lose a million dollars, if you lose a hundred dollars whatever everyone has losses and if you're this guy who's who's batting you know a thousand percent never fucking loses always wins okay i mean that that's that person i i try to look i like trying to look inwards and like how you talked about if you're a buddhist monk you're probably gonna do successful i try my best and you know i'm not very religious right that but i try to detach myself from money because i realize yes there's importance to it and i do work hard for my money at the same time, I want my money to work hard for me. So if I'm in the position, right, and, I, and I'm not doing this all day, every day, right, I have to go to a job and work to, to, act, to even be thinking about doing this. So my level of concern, it's a, I check my emotions at the door because I'm already fate looking at the screen. I'm here at the table. I'm doing what I set out to do. All of the planning research that I've done thus far has led me here. That's kind of like where I, I, and I try not to get too big on it, but it's like, well, you're, you're right here looking at it for a reason. You're about to swipe up and, and submit that trade for a reason. You're about to place that order for a reason. Go ahead and do it, see what happens. That type of attitude, at least for me, thus far has been beneficial. Now, I'm gonna lie. And there have been times where I am trigger happy and I, and I, and I go ahead and I swipe up and it's like, Oh, I, I should have been patient. Okay. Well, instead of getting pissed off about it and throwing away and, 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 and deleting my account, which I know friends that have done that, I take the high road and I try to look at it half full, half the glass half full and say, okay, well, Hey, you, you, you got to learn something there. And if you don't learn it, then you, you're going to keep making mistakes like that. And that's really as simplistic as I try to approach anything like what i just did right now i now that i look about it instead of like saying okay well i hope that was a good a good purchase i'm always thinking in, in like the wolf of wall street now jordan belfort says the only problem you're gonna have is that you wish you had bought more that's kind of like where my mentality 
throws, right? A different type of look is like, damn, I had a gut a billion for a reason. How come I didn't buy more? And your your future self is going to say, how come you didn't fucking buy more? But, hey, I digress. Yeah, there's that's, only yeah, so that's, many, that's there's FOMO, only so dude. many. There's only, yeah, there's only so much of that that you can play in yourself. And, and I, that's why your portfolio, at least for me, is I treat this like gold uh, for some reason. Like everyone's like, you got to have a little bit of gold in your portfolio and gold this. And I'm like, okay, well, uh, now the way I'm starting to look at it is that I think you should have a little bit of Ethereum in your portfolio. And that's kind of like being bullish on something. I don't need you to buy it for me to feel comfortable in my position. I need myself to, to do the job and research what I'm putting my money into. So if it takes me falling to bed, listening to Bloomberg reports or purchasing Barron's or listening to the, you know, podcasts and, and, and things, just over consuming myself with knowledge, it just kind of lends myself to think, well, if you're doing all of this stuff, all, all your, your physical body needs to do because your mentality, your mental self is already checking itself and your, your emotions are already checked. So it's just like this, this list of things that I do before I'm like, okay, today I'm looking at where it's at. Well, Hey, it, okay. Met that check mark. So now it's all about my physical self, bringing my physical self to the trade and then, you know, kind of seeing where, where it goes. And honestly, man, like if I kind of treat things like if it's like a coin toss and you know, I, like how you said about if you're losing so much, then you should be okay. And that's kind of where I'm at with my investing. Yeah. That 231. Okay. All well, right. Well, you know, you know, as you were, as you were throwing your philosophy at me, I was like, you know, I was like, I should tell him to dump it right now, but I don't know. Like you bought it on, uh, on Robin hood. Yeah. Um, what are their, what are their fees like? Cause they have fees now, don't they? No, they're still, they're still, uh, no fee. So you could sell no it. You could sell it right now and, and, and you'd be fine. Uh, it takes three days to get into my, uh, transferable account. No, I don't mean, to, uh, I don't mean to settle your account. I mean, you could sell it at this price and it would be in your, it would, it would be in dollar format oh, in your account, you, right? Correct. Yes. I believe so. Yes. Yeah, I was, I was, I was looking at the one minute chart. I was like, eh. I'd, I would, I would tell him if it bounces off of this downward, uh, center line, like to say, if it drops below two thirty, I was like, sell it right there. You could see, and that's, and that's scalping. That's like the, you know, trading the one minute chart, you know, the five minute chart, um, because sometimes you end up with these downward trends, and you know, if you can establish a pattern. At least, you know, in the interim, you could get a couple of, but again, when you're doing that, you have to be trading high volume, you know, so I have to be throwing more money at it. Oh yeah. But, I, it, but you know, in the future, I would say, uh, I see I, my future self purchasing $2,000 worth of Ethereum and doing the same thing that I just did, buying it at 228 and then dumping it at 230 or whatever. Yeah. I see myself doing that eventually. But Over the course that's of the a, day, yeah. That's a different uh, strategy. strategy right now. You yeah. know, like right now, my strategy is try to get a position to where I get it at a, at a low, relatively low cost, own one of these little sons of bitches, and kind of seeing where it goes in the future, and kind of keep checking in with analysis as far as where it's trend. Right, the trend is your friend. So yeah. you know, if I have to dump it and and, and I at a lower. Uh, profit then i'm so be it but yeah i'm definitely trying to make a profit obviously right yeah i you know like i i try to remove uh the uh i've never you know and that's one of the things one of the things that kind of like gives me reassurance i've never been a gambler right like occasionally i'll go buy a lotto ticket or or a number and i don't win and it's you know i i mean it's just uh, I've had I've 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 benefited from having the repeated experience of losing at the Texas Lotto, right? Well, because that's different. discouraging, right? And I'm like, you know what? It's gambling, right? I've been reinforced so many times where it's like I'm I, I don't have fun doing this. Even if you get like a hundred bucks, it's like 
you know, big deal, you know what I mean? Or whatever. Uh, Victor, my, you know, my stepdad, he, he regularly, you know, wins a thousand dollars. I think the most he ever got <laughs> like on a freaking lottery ticket was $10,000, but he's playing constantly. Right. And I know he's negative, you know, over time. So it's like, there, there's gotta be a better way. And, uh, I don't know, man, like this, I think has like, uh, you know, if you're smart enough, you put in the time, you know, and you are, uh, you can come out ahead. You'll have better odds. You'll have better odds than, than gambling. And I've never been driven to the gambling aspect. For me, like the important thing is like, like Ray Dalio says, uh, building uh, meaningful, like having meaningful work and building meaningful relationships. So what gets me excited about this is meeting like the right group of traders eventually over time networking with those people having a long-term relationship with them and doing this because when you pull out all the way out and say well what good is any of this right like if you uh if you talk to the uh the protester on the street and 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 they ask you what good is it like why are you speculating on stocks why are you speculating on crypto and what we do when we do this, when you really look at the big picture, is combined, we are providing liquidity to the market. And that sounds like nonsense to a protester, but what it really means is we're greasing the gears of the economy because this money goes into those crypto assets or that Forex market or those equities, and it provides liquidity, which allows the machine to run. You know, and when I say machine, I'm talking about the whole fucking world. Uh, and and when 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 we seek out the stocks that are worth seeking out, or the cryptos or whatever, um, we are adding to 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 to, the, to that management or that code, uh, which allows them to become innovative, innovative, and and so you know there's there's good that we're doing here it's just that we're not focused on it when we're looking at a chart or when we're doing fundamental analysis but there is a there is a greater good to it so i don't know i'm gonna get off my pulpit no dude this i think i think that having uh having that type of i guess insight is there is for a reason i don't think that that's you know that's just not silly talk or i don't think that's just you flapping your guns i think that's genuine you know i think that's something that you have come to it's not like that just comes out for no reason or that you just learned that today there's lots of experience that came out of what just came out of your mouth you know so i take it as positive i i you know i would take everything every little bit of advice any little bit of uh, experience that anybody is willing to share, I think that adds to their growth, to their longevity. And it adds definitely to whoever is giving that time and giving that person their ear. Because, you know, if I mean, you're not, we're not in, this is like the school. Uh, I guess some people go at, and they learn uh, economics, right? Uh, when they go study or when they get their degree or they get their formal education in the stock market. And then there are people that, like I said, you have to pay for your education. And this is kind of what I lend this to be. I'm, I'm paying for my education in the market, but hopefully I'm getting a return, right? Like I'm ho hopefully I'm paying, uh, paying it with my time and I hopefully to... I get re refunded with a monetary, you know, something. I don't, I don't, I'm again, I don't think there's different portfolios. Like there's a portfolio that you, at least in my book of people that I've been following that you should, your money should be working for you like crazy with dividends. Then you should have a portfolio where it's like, okay, you set it and you contribute to it every year and you're going to open that up tax free when you're, uh, uh, hopefully an old person. And then there's other portfolios like where I, I would imagine, cause I don't consider myself a day trader, obviously, but I would imagine a day trader there. They have a portfolio for however, however many seconds, you know, they, or they have 
um, they're, they can literally say, yeah, I had a position here and that, that was my, my, my book. If you're a day trader, right? I, I created a book for, uh, calling, uh, buying and selling calls and puts. So, I mean, I take it as advice, Joel. I really think that everything that I think that you and I, we're not the exact same when it comes to this racket. Obviously you have your niche of style of investing whereas i do as well you know i i think that they complement each other because i find it fascinating how you can look at a chart and you you have taking taken your lessons and you're applying them whereas i'll take a, a when i look at a chart i don't i try now i try to emulate what you're doing but when I'm purchasing something, I look at it five years ago. To I look at it long term, and I'm saying, okay, well, it was there. Let me let me go see the books, right? Like how we talked about a little bit more fundamental analysis. Okay, well, it's uh, damn. Okay, they, they have all this liquidity. They have all this these you know uh, orders on on back pile or whatever. They're gonna be fine. Disney will be fine. Nike will be. All of these things are gonna be okay. But then there's like a handful of things that I have no idea about. And, you know, I'm trying to learn and really master those things. So, you know, I, like what, I, for I think example? that it's awesome. Like, just like this, like this, dude, like, like crypto. Like to me, I see this as the future or it's now it's happening now. And I'm trying to wrap my brain around it. And there's a whole like all those stuff that you sent me, all those podcasters, all those authors, all those editors, all those publishers. It's a lot. That, it's a lot. That's all they, you see? And I, I, I probably, I don't want to, I, I don't want to bore you with some of the, the, I, the same amount of stuff that you sent me. I have that for the more fundamental, boring approach to investing. The, the John Bo, uh, Boggles, the Warren Buffett's, the Bill Ackman's who short stuff like I find that type of style of investing as as very it's obvious it, everything is new to me but I kind of lend it, it that type of a style of investing lends itself to my behavior more than anything else really but I why, can why do you, I, why I do you think that, that is like I could tell you that like oh. this shit feels like you know like I mean so when I was in middle school we had this project where we bought stock off of the newspaper right and all we had i mean we we're kids we we're like in eighth grade and so i bought what i saw when i was out with with my mom which was like exxon and target and you know like stores that we were going to and i, I think a lot of people do that that project in school and i had a good experience i think i made some money uh but and so and that was exciting to me so that i so i know that this isn't the only reason i know that you know, the, the, the price action and the movement of the market is interesting, but getting on a chart and doing some like analysis in this way, I mean, the colors on my chart will point to it. It's like, I feel like I'm playing a video game. Like it's like, uh, it's okay. Dude, it's exciting, dude. It's exciting. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but so, so I understand why this style lends to, to my personality. And I'm not really actually that into video games, but it feels like an arcade. It's that arcade vibe. So what do you think it is about fundamental analysis that 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 pulls on your heartstrings? I think it's the concept of owning a piece of a company that is literally being thrown around by people that have significantly a lifetime's worth of money that I'll never ever have. And knowing that, but still, but still participating in the movement as a shareholder of, as a shareholder as a, as and, a partial owner of a company. And I think uh, one of the uh, Joseph Carlson uh, is very influ uh, influential YouTuber who I follow. He uh, talked about it today where once you receive your first dividend that, that you should you should really celebrate that because that is it's nothing to, to scoff at. So I think my to answer your your question in a roundabout way is that I find I find that it's a 
it lends itself to my style of, uh, uh, of just the way I am that I, I appreciate the, the nature of looking at some numbers, understanding what I'm investing in and being okay with it and, and, and being confident with my purchase. I don't buy a lot of things. I, uh, I, I, when I, growing up, my parents used to, we used to go to solo surf and we used to go to Goodwill and put things on layaway. And you ask a kid today, what the hell's layaway? They don't know what the <laughs> hell layaway is. Yeah. And so I'm old enough to know layaway and solo. Layaway surf. That's a concept and solo I've surf. Not fucked with it. Imagine, time. imagine the shareholders of solo surf. I bet you they were like, I bet they lost probably so much fucking money because at one point I'm pretty sure that was trading. I don't know, but I mean, I don't know. Anyways, I, I just think now whenever I buy something, it 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 costs it costs a pretty penny. Like, uh, but it, but I use it, I use it to the, and I wear it down to where I won't buy it again, the same thing again for years, you know? So I, I buy a $200 pair of, uh, running shoes. I will run 500 miles in that and I log it and I track it. And I, you know, I, I have my Strava account to tell me, okay, in, in, in this pair of shoes, I've run X amount of miles. Okay. Well, around the 100 mile mark, that's when your shoes are literally probably at their most optimal. Okay, well then I should sign up and do a race. Okay, well then let me see what races I can compete in. What races can I compete in that have an advantage, that I have an advantage in, that I can win either monetary something or a place in something. So I kind of take everything as I'm very competitive and being a, the competitive person that I am, I look to the stock market as a way to beat myself. I'm not beating anybody else. I'm not... And like, how you talking about gambling? A lot of people see poker as gambling. It's not gambling to me because you're not, you're not, you can play, you can beat somebody who has better cards than you. You just know how to play the person. Well, in the stock market, I'm playing myself. I'm not playing the guy who does really well for him. In fact, I'm happy for people that have leverage. They can buy a million dollars worth of a stock that's $5 because they know, shit, they're going to make $500 million when he gets to $10 or whatever the hell it is. They're able to do that, and I'm happy for people that are able to do that. I need to get my shit together to where if that's what I admire, there's a reason why I'm looking at it, and I'm saying, okay, well, that can be you. So I, I never see me versus somebody. I see me comparative to somebody and kind of try to look at it that way. And so I, I, look, I look at these old school investors and the guys that are the Hall of Famers, and I kind of like say, okay, well, damn, like, you know, what? how did Warren Buffett get his – all right, he – he got a book on a thousand ways to make a thousand dollars when he was a kid. And he's just always been attracted to money and I don't blame him. And so, you know, I guess it's my capitalist spirit. I don't know what it is exactly, but it's something along the lines of that, that kind of helps my approach really. You know, you're talking about leverage and I was thinking about how dangerous uh, it can be. I mean, you know, I, it, you're confident and you've done your due diligence and then, then fine um but i was just i can't remember i i lost it now but it, it's just uh <laughs> it's just every i don't know you've said I, that before you've said that yeah, before it's a you've trigger. said that leverage can be that, that it can be scary it can be dangerous yeah it's a trigger for it's a trigger word for me every time you say leverage i'm like I'm going to shoot Justin well, down right now. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I hope that you you understand where I'm coming from. I'm coming from like, okay, dude, if I have buying power in Robin Hood of, let's just say I had $1,000 in my, and okay, any given day, any given moment, I could drop $1,000 on a stock or now with fractional shares, I can buy it all across the board. Right. I would, I would take the position to say, you know what, today I feel like using my leverage. I feel like using my buying power. And going after something and owning it, really owning that stock, because when it does fluctuate and it does start to move with the economy, that to me, it makes the dangerous aspect in your eyes, I would imagine, and I'm not trying to use your words, but I would, how you say it can be dangerous. I do agree with you that it can be dangerous for a lot of different reasons, but I see it as a danger like oh whoa that hey i'm able okay that's like a good danger in my in my eyes right that's kind of where i lend it so i hope you don't think whenever i use the word leverage i use it as like well damn well i wish i had 
that to be able to do it. I just think that it is earned. I really think that it's earned, right? If you're a millionaire and you go buy, and you can buy any stock that you know eventually, especially right now, if you can go in anytime right now and just throw a dart, dude, at any company, bro, and you know that in five years, you within the five years, you can you can pull the trigger again. You can take the dart out and just say, okay, I made my return. Uh, oh, well. And okay, that's cool. It's just about getting there. Oh, man. It, I mean, maybe because that's the way the productivity uh, curve goes. The productivity curve, the, the concept is that over a long enough timeline, it's always going to be going up. Uh, it's just like, that's, uh, that's the concept of dr like drawdowns, right? Have you, have you heard of that? Have you, have you heard that word before drawdowns? It's like when you, when you take a trade because you think it's going to go up or you buy a product cause you think it's going to go up and it goes down. And so in order to make sure that you don't lose that money and you can't do this obviously with like shorting and leverage, but like, if you're just long a stock, um, you the idea is that you're going to hang on to that even if it drops down to a penny uh, because you don't want to lose that money. And so, so, so you just stay in it until it gets back at least until the break even point. And uh, like, I don't know, that stuff is, uh, I mean, it's helpful if you don't want to lose money and you have all the time in the world, but uh, it, yeah, I just get scared of drawdowns. Like I get, you, like I said, you know, I get like what you're fucking, saying. I'm a scaredy I, I, cat, you know? No, 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 no. I, I think that, well, I mean, if I'm hearing you correctly, you're just a little bit more conservative than than I am, perhaps. But uh, but when it comes down to it... Uh, oh, it sounds like you're, you're, you're conservative with, with, with certain aspects, with, uh, with your analysis. Like, I mean, okay. Uh, y yes, yes and no. Like, I, I'm conservative to the point of, like, I'm not just going to, like anything like i said okay if i spread across I, again with my holdings i don't like to have too many holdings because then i'm i'm, I'm then i'm way too thin right uh, in my fundamental approach yeah you want to be diversified and and that's a that's a scary word in my opinion diversification what? that's why that, is that scary it can be because if you're too spread out then it's like oh well you know i I, I'm in this sector. Oh, I, you know, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not really, I have all my eggs in this sector. Oh, okay, let me put them into this other sector, even though I, I don't feel as strongly about it, but I just have to be diversified. So just for the sake of being diversified, that to me is what I mean as far as like, it can be scary just because you, you have the FOMO effect or whatever it is because you really don't want to be left out whenever, uh, whenever the QQQ goes crazy and, and Tesla's selling above whatever, you know, that type of diversification. Uh, so you're, you're over here trying to catch a giant. You're trying to catch a well. And all of a sudden, you let go of all the little minnows that grew into great big fish. So, you yeah. know, that's what I mean, I guess, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. Like you're... Um... Yeah, like, I mean, you're just worried about certain sectors. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, like, I guess because if you just buy an index fund and you'll be okay. You, that's, uh, hey, what's up, Raymond? Well, yeah, because the, the diversity is built in almost. Yeah, and so they, it kind of takes away all the whole, the entire aspect of uh, stop picking, picking different stocks, picking different ones that actually – you, you really did the homework in and you're okay with where it goes because if you're if you're long on it then you, you don't care what it does the next few days so dude I look at I'm bitcoin cash like dude sorry sorry to interrupt look at bitcoin cash dude it's so much bullshit dude why what is going on with it well it's just it never recovered from 2018 i haven't i i don't fuck with bitcoin cash so i haven't even really looked at it recently but yeah, there's hmm. some cryptos that are just hopeless. Ah man, so, like is it somebody made We're at money. the bottom. Oh, I saw something about there was like a X amount that was put into to, to something with it. I, I read something on your screen. I think that's what I saw. Oh, uh, okay. 
No, I'm looking at QQQ right now because you mentioned it. Oh. Um. Yeah. yeah that dude, one I have set nuts. up in a few different. I have it. Did you have it portfolios. before COVID? Did you have QQQ before COVID? No. Damn, I did not. I know. I know. Late to the party with that one. Yeah. You know, I was like, uh, I, I thought I learned my lesson like with, uh, with Bitcoin with 2018 and then, uh, 2017. Um, but you know, whenever we hit these bottoms, something's going on in the world, you know, or something or you're new to the game or something's going on and it's just, it's just weird, man. It's like, uh, it's the universe, you know, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the universe is, uh, is like, oh, you think you're gonna get a leg up uh -huh. on the market knowing all that, you know, oh, well, let me just occupy you with, uh, with something that's going to be just enough to get you to stop thinking about your portfolio. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, but what's that? You know, there's so many sayings it, it, that I've heard when it comes to investors. Like, yeah. Um, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The next yeah, time right. is tomorrow or some shit like that. So it's always so funny to me whenever I see like, uh, different types of styles of people who are throwing their money at the same stock, you know, and I see all the activity March 23rd for QQQ. And honestly, I didn't even fucking know about QQQ when I got my Robinhood account. But at the same time though, I was more interested in buying Disney and uh, Boeing. Those are the first two companies that I bought on that day. And Ever since then, I've been addicted, and uh, I, in hindsight, I should have just saved up and, and kept pumping money into QQQ. But uh, you know, it is what it is. I, like I said, I pay for my education. That's the way I see it. Yeah, I think we're gonna be. I'm looking at QQQ. I think. I think this is. I mean, it can't go up. It'll. Be, I mean, it's already retraced today. But like, I think we'll be going down a little bit. Just it's so obvious. Like. That's the, yes. thing, that, that's the thing with like with with stocks and with uh, with uh, you know just traditional markets like these charts from a from a from a technical analysis point of view are just so predictable because there's people on the other side of the order uh, even you know like even if you're long and it's going down there's people on the other side of the order you can call it dumb money you can call it uh, institutional investors that are beginning their their uh that's their... what i was looking for you nailed it the word institutional investors yes They're those guys that that the, those are the ones that i try to the, the, they do it for a fucking living don't they right so... like let me see if i can articulate this because i'm not very articulate so remember i was telling you that they they make money going long even when the stock is going down right the way they do that is like uh basically cost averaging with like high volume, right? So like a, like a day like today where we had a strong retracement and we're already at the top of this upward trend channel. Um, what they're going to do, because it's the only way that they can make money at the volume that they're trading. If they were like, okay, it's time to short because we're at the top of the market. Let's throw a fucking billion dollars at QQQ or however much you know, just like a huge amount at this one thing, they're gonna, they're gonna throw so much money into it that it'll shoot the price up and the, and, and the, and the, and the, uh, they'll short themselves. Right. Right. They, they wouldn't, yeah. They, I mean, they wouldn't be able to, to, they, it's just where they would shoot it way down. And it's like, it's counterproductive for them to go all in at the top or at the bottom of the chart. So what they do is on a day like today, they'll put a tiny amount, they'll short a tiny amount. And then tomorrow it's still a tiny amount, but maybe it's a little bit more and then a little bit more. And they know that guys like you and me are, uh, are putting in large position or, or large shorts or whatever. Cause we're like, okay, it's definitely going down. Meanwhile, there's other investors, dumb money or whatever, who think that they're they're writing the FOMO, so they think the movement's gonna go up. Oh, it's just a pullback today, 
price is gonna go up. So they'll they'll go in long, trying to make some short term money. There's all these different hands, but they're just cost averaging in at the most unsuspecting times. And by the time the price is down at the bottom of the uh, of the of the of the of the chart, everybody is freaking out so much. You know, they're selling off their positions, and these guys have already been putting in shorts. Now they're cashing in. Yes. And they have all of us on the other side of the order flow feeding into those larger movements. And so that's yep. when that's when it turn turns around. As soon as it turns around, they're cashing in all those positions. So and that's what causes the market to turn around. So they're able to do exactly of what everybody else is doing. They'll make money. Fucking brilliant, dude. When I first heard that, I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. And how you said you're fucked either way because <laughs> somebody fucking already knows somebody already knows that so yeah. they're already feeding they're already feeding into somebody else's emotion and once you can do that to somebody you control them regardless of you you never have to meet them a day in your life yeah one of the things that i still haven't figured out and i i keep on meaning to tell you this every time i bring up institution um if you look at finviz remember i sent you that web website finviz and it gives you yeah, all yeah, this yeah. data on, on stock charts there's a number, like let's say you pull up Pepsi or Tesla. There's a number on that graph because it gives you a matrix of all the numbers. Uh, one of those numbers is institution. And, and it's a percentage, I believe, right? And basically what that is, is it's, uh, it's how, many, how much of that stock is owned by high level institutions like banks, right? So it's like Credit Suisse and Wells Fargo and all those guys, they might own a large amount of a certain stock. And that number is important to pay attention to uh, because uh, it's gonna be less volatile. Um, and, uh, and, and, and if there's a high level of institution, um, I can't remember exactly what significance it is again because i'm i don't fuck with stocks as much but um there's some significance to that number and it has to do with uh like uh volatility and order placement so that's a good number like to get your your mind around but what i was going to say before that was um was with 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 crypto i still haven't really figured out like the the ins and outs of how institutions are trading crypto i don't know if they're even involved like uh to a great degree i know like there's hedge funds and and like like medium level funds that are that are holding bitcoin and, and ethereum and stuff like that but i don't know like to what degree they're manipulating the market there's got to be whales manipulating it there's got to be like uh like funds manipulating the price because every everything is manipulated to one degree or another uh, but I still, I still haven't gotten my mind around how they're manipulating. This is such good topics and good content. Yeah, I, I think I'm gonna um, uh, close out the recording for a minute, just because I think we're passing like an hour or two. So that's a good okay. couple of yeah, minutes. Yeah, 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 yeah.